Today's chat is brought to you by, well, all of your support. Through the patronage you provide the Focus Fire chat team through Podbean's crowdfunding, we are able to provide you with the weekly podcast as well as the website and other aspects of Focus Fire chat. If you have any interest in becoming a patron of the FFC, please be sure to visit our website and click on the support link. Even a single dollar helps. And for those of you who are already patrons, thank you again for your generosity. You may have heard the whispers of guardians gathering in the shadows, exploring the mysteries of this world and the worlds which surround us. We are all in search of truth. Sometimes we need to focus that search. Focus that fire! And so we come together! Welcome to Focused Fire Chat! Welcome to Focus Fire Chat, recorded live on March 20th, 2020, over on twitch.tv slash Focus Fire Chat. As always, I want to give a big shout out to our live chat with us here with us tonight. Thank you so much for joining us once again. This week's episodes are going to be focused around exploring the lore book Letters from Eris. This particular episode will serve as what we have come to call the intro session of the week's exploration. Before we get any further, however, let's run through a quick introduction of who all we have with us on the show. As always, this is your host, Blue Crew 86 And this is the Get Good and Trials Green-Eyed Music Lover for the week. <laughs> got, yeah. some, got some hard light going up against you, don't you? You know, the light shows are real. The light <laughs> shows are so real and crucible right now. I feel like I'm at a rave. I just need some, like, I actually turned on some techno music <laughs> just to, like, make it match what's going on on the screen because frickin' A... You guys with the hard lights, I get that it's good, but at least put on Suros so I don't have to see it. Just put on Suros. It's fine. (laughs) Oh, and last but definitely not least in the hot seat as guest co-host, we have our good friend Neo Mad Dog. Neo, how are you doing tonight? Oh, I'm doing great. Happy to be here. But I'm going to use my revoker to get rid of all those puns. (laughs) Right? (laughs) So much. So you, so yeah, okay, go for it, Green, go for it. Ah, uh, so, okay, Neo, we kind of chatted a little bit more online and, like, Twitter and Discord a bit over the over the few years. First thing I wanted to know was just kind of the general shout-outs of where can we find you online, or where if somebody wanted to reach out to you to ask you more questions about the lore or anything like that, what what would be the links that you would give them? Uh, you can just find me on Twitter at Neo Mad Dog. It's in the title. Um, that's I don't really post anything. I'm not like active on Twitter, but I keep notifications on. So if you send me a message, I'll definitely get it. Nice, cool. So the second question, as always, what is your favorite lore story in Destiny? I definitely say Emperor Callus. Um, I just like everything about that story, like from the beginning. I, I want like more information about the conspirators that uh, overthrew him. And then like, and the big question is what did he see? You, I think are in a slight <laughs> minority in that one. I want to know more about this. What, a, like, is it the, the draw of what is eventually could happen with it, especially with what we got um, with the fourth horseman story that was just started coming out or what drew you into him in particular? Well, I think what drew me in initially was the first Leviathan raid is reading all the lore tabs that came with the armor set and, and the weapons. And you realize like, oh, there's a lot more going on with the cabal than just warmongering turtles that want to blow up planets. The right. whole culture behind it that I think is really fascinating. And, um, and also like they have obviously have the resource to make big things. And I want to see like, what, what did Callus make? Cause he doesn't seem to be too much of a warmonger. In comparison to some of the, like the more military ones, yeah, for sure. Uh, from there, though, like, is that the story that really got you drawn into it? Because I know I've seen you around before the Kala story became a big, big thing. Like, is there a, a particular story in Destiny that really drew you in? Or I think, I guess, so to go back, like how I got into Destiny is like, I think I started playing in vanilla D1. I played the beta, but I didn't buy it initially. I actually rented it for like a week, um, a month after, and I didn't really care much for the story. I'm used to 
the grandiose stories that Halo gave us and like mm-hmm. and vanilla D1 was admittedly lackluster. Right. And I just kind of put off Destiny from then. But around Taken King, I just said, wait a minute, there's more going on here. And I think I saw a Mylan video around that time where, where like the Books of Sorrow and I'm like, oh, um, Books of Sorrow came later. I was, um, but I think that was when I started getting into the lore. It's like, oh, there's a there's there's more to than just what's on the screen. Yeah, for sure. So myelin is kind of like that entry that entry drug for you to get into it. Is there a particular story that back in D one, I guess, would be the one that drew you in? Because uh, Callus is only D two. So was there something in D one that really got you going or? Yeah, uh, I would probably say the Reef Wars, that which came out with the House of Wolves. I like like chronicles of like battles and um, politics around it, and I thought that was really interesting. How you had these three individual wannabe Kells in the House of Wolves after their initial Kell died by the Harbingers, mm-hmm. and they're kind of vying each other for power getting the Awoken attack one side so they can climb up the ranks. And then ultimately Skolas came out on top and then was given to the nine after their defeat. Right. Okay. And before we get to kind of the crazy question that I told you, I would ask you, what is your primary class? Uh, I started off as a hunter, but now I main warlock jump and all, Um, (laughs) but, but I play all three, but warlock's my favorite. Okay. We'll forgive you. Um, yeah, especially D2 Warlock. The jump makes more I, sense. It does make more sense. And I actually have less less saltiness for most Warlocks, even though I kind of give Warlocks just crap in general because they're easy to make fun of because they get a little verklimp sometimes. But uh, <laughs> No. When, just the, the, when the Whisper mission came out, my friend who I always play Destiny with basically ordered me not to play on a hunt not to play on a warlock so i could actually do the jumping puzzles even though yeah. i'm pretty good with warlock jump <laughs> i mean it's easy now luckily i mean the whisper mission because of the light level being such a huge discrepancy you can do whisper solo basically now light I saw, levels oh, i so saw an good. esoteric video about it that was really funny i told my friend about it and he soloed it yeah right after. It's not too bad. Basically, Blue, if you wanted to go get Whisper, now is the time <laughs> to how, do it. I, I love want. how this suddenly turned into basically Blue. <laughs> if you want to go get that. You can get Outbreak <laughs> too, Blue. Yeah. yeah I've heard, can, I heard about that one. I think the Outbreak uh, jumping puzzle is a little bit more difficult than the Whisper one, though. Yeah, because the but, yeah, I've, I've, I've been told the same. Yeah. That the Outbreak jumping puzzle is a bit of a, bit of a fun one. That's okay, though. As long as you're not... I mean, the basic one isn't too bad, but it's the getting the catalyst that's always a little bit more tricky. Mm -hmm. But, Neo, I was going to ask you about your opinion of this season's gear, because you talked to me about how you are a bit more of a fashionista of a warlock, and how you are really into like getting your gear sets to look exactly how you want. How do you feel about this season's gear with the streetwear? Oh, pimp, I love the, the pimp lock. I love the pimp. I'm like, uh, I'm, there's a Discord channel uh, mm-hmm. from the subreddit Warlocks Rise Up, which is only Warlock mains, and the sub icon now is the pimp coat. That's awesome. <laughs> I love it. And the and the Titan set got a bad rap because of the picture initially, oh, yeah. but if you put shaders on it, it's actually pretty. Good. <laughs> It's actually, yeah, I haven't seen too many warlock or too many titans look. I just think the colors that they chose for the picture is what made that one it so just, it just awkward. Is, all I can see with that one is Cole's uh, dragons. Oh, I know the the derpy dragons that eat the man. Uh, oh. Not that bad. It really isn't like those sets actually mix really well with other currently owned yes. gear, which is nice. Which I think was kind like, of the I, point too, right? Was the like the street aesthetic was going to kind of be a good mix match with everything? I I guess so. Like I'm wearing the street gear. The only thing I think that I'm wearing that is not street gear is the helmet because the helmet and the street gear is shiny, mm-hmm. so it shows up on crucible maps a little bit too easily. 
and the arms because I want to have my Oath Keepers on. So yeah, yeah. but as as far as like the pants and the jacket and the and the cloak, oh, it's so pretty. Mm-hmm. I love the it. cloak, especially the cloak is super pretty. Well, the cloak actually ties into the pants as far as the hunter goes. Oh, it does it? Nice. Mm-hmm. And the warlock one actually isn't too bad. It's a little bit more, uh, like we were kind of teasing, a little bit more pimpalicious. But, <laughs> you know, I don't it's know too many. It's the It is. Yeah, it is. It's, it it's, really all he needs is. is a cane. All he needs is the cane. <laughs> you know, the thing is, is if you pick up the, oh gosh, which sword is it? There's a sword that has a dagger on the end of it. <laughs> I want to say... <laughs> I want to say it's the one for the moon that has air. Like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. like stuff. the one that's got the 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 hook or the hammer thing. If you uh, got the climbing if you combine, hook. If you combine the warlock pimp coat with like the trials helmet, there's your pimp hat. <laughs> there you <laughs> go. Not, not, not the not the trials of Osiris one. You need the trials of the nine one because that's yeah. all, all out there. Yeah, it's just oh gosh, yeah. Wicked was running around with the sword from the moon the other day, and I was like, oh, you got your pimp cane to go with your pimp outfit now. And he's like, I'm immediately taking this off. I'm ashamed. I'm like, (laughs) I am ashamed of myself. (laughs) It's fine. It's hilarious. You shouldn't be ashamed of that. You gotta own it. (laughs) Oh, he does. Trust me. He has no problem feeling his his pimpiness, I guess, if we're gonna make this an adjective of some sort. Oh, lord. Yeah. But... That is all for me, Blue. Do you have any sort of uh, notes for the community this week? Yes, actually, I do actually have something that I wanted to take a moment to kind of talk about Uh, tonight. I just wanted to give a quick update on how basically how everything's going to be running uh, start basically starting tonight in light of all the events going on out in the world, you know. Just like with everything else, we are, you know, we are human, so we are affected by it all as well. Um, We are still going to be having episodes, uh, so don't worry about that. But the format is actually going to be a bit more relaxed. Uh, The primary changes will be we're going to put top three on basically a hiatus. We're going to pause top three for the time being. And with the plans that once schedules get a little bit more steady and events start calming down a bit, we're going to be bringing it back. Uh, So don't worry about missing out on those shenanigans or at all. Uh, For the normal FFC episodes, we are planning on still having two each week. So we'll still have the introduction and the advanced sessions. However, we will be a little bit more lax in those. Uh, For those in live stream, you will probably be watching us play during the show. Uh, This is actually due to the team, just the same as the rest of you guys out there, needing a bit of levity in our schedules. and, And really, this is a way to fit kind of two birds with one stone. Um, so that being the case, we're still going to do our utmost to be to maintain the accuracy of what we are speaking about. Uh, topics are still being chosen as they currently are. Our weekly streams are still at this time, still planned to take place every Friday evening at 10 p.m. Central. Uh, we know that for those who have spent some time with us already and for those who might be joining us for the first time, that a sense of normalcy is really important, especially when everything else seems to be chaotically running amok. So mm-hmm. while the environment while the environment around us is kind of uncertain, our hope is that our community can be a source of support, inspiration, and comfort for any who need it. Uh, for those who are wanting a space to talk about the events, we have opened up a new channel within our Discord server that is dedicated to discussions around current events. And for those who would prefer to take a break from all the news that is being thrown at us from pretty much every direction currently, uh, we encourage you to join in on the other amazing discussions. So feel free to mute the channel for the current events uh, so that you can instead take a break and just discuss something about your favorite game, your book, a uh, favorite movie. Um, hopefully, maybe that some of some the freeing up of our schedules, I guess you could say, the past few days have kind of hopefully maybe given you time to catch up on. Uh, it's kind of the s- s- silver lining, I guess, of all this stuff going on. Um, but basically, to wrap this little announcement up, I just want to remind everyone that though the journey is difficult and the road is long, I, I mean, we find strength and the will to endure together. Uh, so we're gonna. We promise that we will be there for you if you need support. Um, just please be safe and keep your eyes up. Mm-hmm. But absolutely. Uh, and I, then, of course, we have our our standard, you know, housekeeping notes, and we'll jump right into the intro session. 
If you're enjoying the show, please be sure to let us know by giving us a shout over on Twitter, leaving a comment on Podbean, or sending us a quick email at focusfirechat at gmail.com. Reviews or comments on where we can improve are always welcome. They let us know what we can do better to create a more enjoyable experience for everyone. To all who have sent feedback or left us a review, thank you. As many of you are aware, Focus Fire Chat is a community in which we offer the chance to dive into lore from within various titles and mediums, with a special focus on the Destiny universe. Every Friday at about 10 p.m. Central, the podcast team gets together to stream a summary of the chosen topic for that week. The hope for this is to help encourage dives into aspects of game lore within both our Discord server and within the other communities we share the digital world with. If you're a fan of lore in all its various forms, be sure to also check out thelorenetwork.com, a central hub for content that covers a wide variety of different titles and mediums. Our full show notes for each week's topic will be posted there, so for the additional information and guest details, be sure to check the site out. Our next topic is going to be a look at the weapons from Season 9 of Destiny. That being said, however, we still want to hear your thoughts about this week's topic. Be sure to weigh in over on Discord, and don't be shy in tagging any of the team in on the conversation. We can't wait to read what your thoughts are. But for now, let's get back to the show. Green, do you have a a good uh, man cocktail knowledge for us so, this week? Well, the weird thing, and we talked about this a little bit in chat, in chat between you, Neo, and I on how this this book in particular is more of a collection of letters to the queen or Ikora rather than like a bunch of huge revelations. And so the cocktail cocktail knowledge for this book in particular is fairly light in comparison to things like revelation or uh crack and mare. But this one in particular is a, it's an interesting perspective of seeing Eris go through the accumulation of the nightmares as we're mm-hmm. going through the weeks of shadow keep, as well as kind of seeing her progression of empathizing with some of these various nightmares and mm-hmm. kind of sort of getting pushed into a psychological state where she's, she's not necessarily in the best of places by the end of it. I mean, we'll find that out as we get go through them, but she s- sends these letters both to the queen and to Ikora, though some of the letters are s- explicitly for the queen and some of them are explicitly for Ikora. Um, I believe Ikora only has two or three different letters. The rest of them are to the queen. Yeah. Ikora and- has, well, Ikora shares the last one and then she has two others. So she technically has mm-hmm. three. Yeah. Um, I want to interrupt you real quick uh, because you brought up something that actually has been, I, I wouldn't say it's been bugging me, um, mm-hmm. but it's a question that I keep coming back to uh, every time I read these. And, and I think it's it's one of those that in hindsight, it's probably kind of obvious. But to me, I think that if you haven't read these entries uh, or played the the nightmare hunts i have i haven't played all the hunts themselves but i've read pretty i've read the transcripts and all that stuff um the thing that keeps standing out to me here as a huge question for this entire not just this lore book but actually this entire this particular season which was the core uh shadow keep season um and especially with the nightmares was the question of whose nightmares are these because well, i well because and, and this is going to probably be my one thing that I do keep coming back to, not just in the intro, but in the advanced session, too, because the more and more I sit on it, you know, I really don't think these are our nightmares. There are some that are specifically our nightmares, but there's also ones that there, okay, I don't know yes, if Eris right. ever had any, entries, any experience the entries, with. Though. The entries, though. Right. But, like, Eris talks about not only Fogoth and Crota and Omnicle, which are obviously from her story, but she also mentions characters like Mind or not Mindbender, Fickrel, and, and, um, mm-hmm. Gaul. Gosh, who else did she mention? Gaul. Gaul and some of the other ones that are specific. I mean, she would have knowledge of these. And the thing, and the reason, and and we'll get, we'll probably get into this a lot with, especially when we start talking about like the psychology of it. Um, But because the, so, and I see like the whole combination, like they take manifestation from our minds, but of all of us, you know, 
Eris is the one that continuously empathizes with him. And then there's also the entire essence essence quests that we actually mm-hmm. that this feeds into that the essence leads into nightmare hunts, which then leads into um, or the nightmare hunts give us the essence, which leads us to the essence quests, which are concurrent with the memories of Eris's fire team, who is also mm-hmm. she's the only one that's getting haunted. And it's it's only I would argue it's only through purification of those various essences that we actually are able to unlock and purify uh, the true memories of Eris's fire team, and actually, you know, this this entire uh, DLC, I, I don't know, DLC season DLC, I don't know what you want to call it. The whole the whole story arc is really actually a really really well done expose in the world of Destiny on the process of grief and depression. Like, I, I really do appreciate how they did Eris's kind of coming to terms with the haunting of her character. Uh, it was really, I think it was really well done. Yeah. I do think that there are aspects that are tied specifically into the cleansing of the essences. I do think also that not only is there the cleansing of the essence, but there's the, when we bring those specific artifacts to Eris to help her push past her grief, essentially, right? To help her rid herself of these yeah. various ghosts. To help her remember. We, I think it's remember the true memory, I think, is the way they explain it. Yeah, I mean, it's remember the true memory, memory but it's also remember the... It's remembering aspects that are not just the death. It's not just the major event. And I think that's a pretty important thing in anybody's case when it comes to depression you have to remember that there are things outside just the major events right like that's the whole point of going through and identifying kind of seeing the brighter side of things or Mm -hmm. seeing the sunny side of things yeah as terrible as a as a kind of analogy as that is but with eris in particular we are not only showing her kind of these those same memories or giving her those opportunities for it, but we're making her face her fears. And that's one of the things that in these cards you see she's absolutely, especially in these early ones, she's absolutely terrified to deal with these. She thought she had moved past them and she doesn't want to deal with them again. And it's the idea that grief comes up multiple times in your life, not just the one time and move past it. Sometimes it comes back more than once and you have to deal with it over and over again yeah the other thing that i i saw i I can't remember where i saw it but i saw someone writing about this that they really liked the uh the i use this word gently time gating of the process of of Mm -hmm. addressing these things because it drives home in a in in a kind of a weird way it drives home that grief isn't done in one sitting like it takes it takes time to address these things and that's kind of like i don't know if that was the intent i mean you can argue i'm I'm not going to get into the meta argument of it but if as far as like the content that's how i i kind of as soon as i read that i was like you know what that's a really cool way to kind of take up that the way that that's presented was like this is a message that says you know hey grief you can't cram grief into you know a one week's worth of grinding like it takes weeks, it takes months, it sometimes takes years to deal with these things. And that's kind of what we had to do as guardians as we were helping Eris in addressing her memories. Because if you remember with the the memory quests, they were one a week. I think it was like five, wasn't it five or six weeks? Because did they start the first week or did they start the second week? It started the first week with Saimoda. So, yeah, okay, mm-hmm. so it's, it's, I think it was Sai, Vel, Toland, Omar, and then finally Ariana. Um, and so like, I mean, but I thought that was a cool way of kind of looking at it was like, I was like, you know, that's actually, that actually makes it really, I really appreciate that, that perspective of it because that is, that's, that is accurate because it gives that time frame within the world. It kind of shows, okay, this is, I've gotten this piece done. Now I got to do the next piece. And you know, that that's, that's, that's the process of, of healing from that type of trauma. Yeah, I I would agree with that. I do think that Eris is not healed. Oh no. But that's one thing I want no. to make very clear. She is not healed by our efforts. Like there are things that Eris is dealing with that we do not come anywhere near close to touching. That it that would be correct, but I think that she is better 
she she also recognizes she says this and i think it's uh uh i think it's Sco- no tanix tanix i think it's tanix the entry but she talks about how she has realized that she was self-exiling herself which is a common trait in those who are grieving or who are depressed they push people away um it's a and and she kind of she she addresses that piece and she remembers uh it's when she talks about Cade uh she she says that you know she remembers him fondly you know and and that was kind of always the joke between the two they always kind of had this hate hate relationship you know it was kind of like this love hate it was it it's was like a that love little hate. brother hate yeah yeah it was like a sibling relationship between the two of them mm-hmm. and i i think that Oh gosh, what was it? Was it the web comic that someone had where she came and put the rock on his map at the end? God, there was there was a web comic that was basically remember. like someone after after Cade had been killed, uh, someone did like this like non non canonical uh, little web comic where Eris basically came and uh, like basically left a left a left her rock on his map as kind of this kind of thing. Um, and then there was I think there was the line where Cade. I think it was in Cade's stash. He made a comment to Eris about you can you can have it, um, but it, I think that was that was really t- a really cool entry was because Eris realizes the importance of you know community mm-hmm. and she she is completely because there's the whole scene mm-hmm. with oh yeah go for it. I'm just thinking that as far as her and community and everything, she's still very isolated in comparison to. The Guardians comparison to Ikora, she doesn't even necessarily want to report back to the Queen at this point, according to this book. And this is one of the latest books from Shadowkeep. This is this takes place over the entirety of it. Correct. Yes. And well, that being or go for it, Neo. Yeah, there's there well she I think Eris is I mean, yeah, she's still struggling, but she is sort of improving in her relationships mm-hmm. with others. Uh, one of the big things was the Festival of the Lost Quest, where you end up getting a toothbrush. That's well, true. Was, Which is where, well, because Eris mentions like there. I think it was actually a voice line where like when I first heard about it, I thought they were like insulting me and what I went through. But now I realize it's more about celebrate celebrating the lives mm-hmm. they used to have rather than mourning the lives that we've lost. That yeah. toothbrush. I really want there to be like. I I high- was. I have cre- or no Vex cream. I was slightly, next year I was slightly sad that we didn't get peanut butter, but I know you wanted ants. Uh, it's log. just like it's just like that would have been the trifecta. It's just like we have the the ascendant celery, we have the ascendant raisins, and tooth or uh, toothpaste. Gosh, now Chad's talking about it. Um, peanut butter. You know, it's just like oh my gosh, that would have been great. But the thing I um, want to know is. Is peanut butter a universal truth, or ants on a log a universal truth? Because if it's not a universal yes. truth that every country loves yes. ants on a log, no, you don't it's, know that. Have you been universal. to every country? Have you have you asked Bife this? Have you asked Where Mylan is, this? Oh, well, is I'm this, gonna I'm gonna message him. Hang on. Yeah, you should message him and figure out is Bife this a universal Mylan. truth? Ants on a log. Is that a delicious <laughs> snack for be like, why young are children? You messaging me. Also, they're kind of probably going to be like, "What the f- is ants on a log? Like, what are you on about?" Bife's awake right now, right? If he's not, he's going to have uh, to get a really weird message. <laughs> yeah, we'll find out. We'll find out here in a second. I'm, I'm messaging Mylan right now. <laughs> oh Lord! But I don't know. I don't know. I as far you know as if I hear back. yeah, sounds good. So, as far as the book themselves, or the book, the entries themselves, do we want to kind of do a quick rundown? Because there's not, there's information in here mostly as a, I think I treat this more of an expose of Eris' continual state during Shadowkeep. I don't know if there's a ton of new information in here that reveals anything about timelines or anything like that, but we at least get kind of her descent into Eris madness i guess mm-hmm. is what i would call it i would say like the first one really kind of because the first one's to mara and it's really kind of her laying out her plans in in so far as Eris ever lays out plans you know she doesn't really 
make it clear but she she kind of is like this is you know we must do what we must do to you know find this um and as far because this was this was the one no not this one not this entry wasn't the oh, which one was it was it regarding the pyramid that came out right after the cut the creepy cut scene yes because I know that I know that one refers to it, but I can't remember if it came out like immediately following it or if it was like. But anyways, the 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 only time frame that we do have was the correlation with that cutscene during Shadow Keep, which is when she mm-hmm. you know walks up to the statue and has the creepy "I know what I'm doing" smile, um, which everyone everyone loved it. I didn't I didn't think anyone freaked out about that at all. I think what the stayed, creepy cutscene? <laughs> what are you talking about? Everyone really? was super calm. No one overreacted about it. There weren't theories thrown about. <laughs> Remember when Mylan posted a video of Eris was evil? I mean... <laughs> God. <laughs> if ever Morla has played a, a character that wasn't slightly evil, I don't... Like, I could see her playing Eris as evil. I just, I just see it. Morla could play evil so easily. Not to say that the writers would make her evil specifically because Morla could play evil, but yeah, the she writers could pull it make off. her. Oh god, yeah, yes, yeah, she could. I've tried to emulate her voice patterns for Eris. <laughs> you remember this? <laughs> oh my god, it's dang near impossible. The woman has such a weird, like she does it in such a way that the voice drips into. A lower timbre, not only just like an actual throughout, but she doesn't end the sentences the same way as normal normal speakers do, and it's frustrating. And I'm cursing, and I'm sorry. I may have had whiskey. That's okay. But anyway, uh, so okay, we have how many entries in this book? There are a lot of entries in this book. Fourteen. Fourteen. Yeah. Okay. I have like just the quickest rundown of like the not only cliff notes of it, but things that I think are slightly important for each of the cards. Let's do it. Uh, Regarding the Great Disaster, this is a report to the Queen where Eris reveals information about the pyramid opening a box in my mind long thought locked. She remembers the Battle of the Moon and Crota Fire Team attempt. So, the idea of Eris has locked away these thoughts for years and years and years, but it has been reopened, reopened Thanks to this pyramid in regarding nightmares, it is a report to Ikora about the nature of the nightmares. She postulates that the pyramid is trying to distract. I cannot shake the feeling that we are being toyed with, that these nightmares are a hindrance to our goal. We must not lose sight of what they are guarding. Perhaps they wish to make us question ourselves and our will to fight, to overcome. So here... Second card, still pretty, uh, pretty re- resolute in what's going on. Everything sounds good. Everything sounds like it should be. Regarding Eris's fire team, a report to the Queen. Vel Tarlo has joined Sai Moda in Eris's torment. Beyond that, there is a terrible pain has resurfaced from a scar that I assumed had healed. Now something is scratching and clawing its way out. That. I feel is the beginning of the cracking of the uh, facade that Eris puts on. You really start to see things come apart in this card in particular. I And I'm sure in the advanced episode, we're going to have more on that in particular, because that one screams um, psychological um, possible. Mm-hmm. Well, not, yeah, warfare, yeah. but also the idea of... a. Um, Reminding somebody of something in particular, like, yeah. you know, a scent memory is such a strong thing, but there's also um, triggers for painful memories can trigger not only the painful memory itself, but pain in that limb. You have, um, what is it called? The ghost limb effect uh-huh. for those who have gone through um, amputees, amputations. All right. Uh, phantom really? limb. My wife from the other room <laughs> provided the phantom <laughs> limb. Thanks, Julie. <laughs> Thanks, Julie. <laughs> uh, regarding Omnigul and Will of Crota, it's a report to the Queen. Eris relays that Omnigul is now part of the Nightmare on the Moon. She reflects that I am aware that these nightmares are not truly what they represent, but the mind can be fooled, even momentarily. 
in those moments lies our lies all the destructive power of the darkness hopes to exploit. I fight back, but the nightmares grow stronger. So Eris is basically starting to postulate, is this how the darkness is going to fight in this one? Regarding the hidden swarm, next card, a letter to the queen. The hidden swarm is di- disorganized and Eris is fearful for the force they could muster if one would rise up to lead them. For all the hive's efforts, they fortunately do not seem to have succeeded in penetrating the pyramid's walls. I think this one in particular goes with what we were talking about, well, what we were going to talk about last week with the, um, oh, is it Interrogation of the Uh, Damned? Yeah, Inquisition. 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 That's what it is. That one would, that one is kind of in tandem with that one regarding the spread of the the release of the additional Apocrypha to it. Yes. Uh, regarding the spread of nightmares, it's a letter to Aricora about how the nightmares are becoming more prevalent. The thing I've noticed between Eris, Eris's letters to the Queen versus Eris's letters to Aricora, the Queen's letters are more detailed and seem to be more personalized mm-hmm. versus the letters to Aricora, which are more of a professional, I am reporting in because I am in hidden and this is what you want me to do kind of thing. Yeah. I think it also stems from the fact that the queen historically has treated Eris as if she, I think, what was it? What was that Eris said? She basically, she treated her as if she wasn't broken. Mm-hmm. Uh, I believe the quote was that uh, the queen sees me as a hunter, not a liability. Right. Right. Yeah. So yeah. there's, was, there's yeah, that. That was, that was, that was the Lord for unfinal right. shapes. Right. Mm-hmm. That was her ship in season four. Yep. 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 All right. So, Moving on, regarding Fogoth the Untamed, it's a letter to the Queen. Eris commiserates about the beast Fogoth, which I found really interesting, saying that she feels the same. Though duty is my oath and privilege, she cannot help but feel trapped by the endless cycle of the fight. Which is interesting to see her starting to empathize more with the quote-unquote enemy at this point. Well, this is also the first one with an enemy listed. Correct. Correct. Rather than the mass of massive groups of things uh, regarding Tanix, the scarred and these are all in reference to nightmares by the way like mm-hmm. Fogoth is one of the nightmares Tanix is one of the nightmares so is Skolas and Gaul and Zydron that we're going to see Omnigal. coming up and, and Omnigal uh, Tanix the scarred a letter to the queen was I truly trapped there or was I keeping myself there was it a self-imposed exile for the disastrous attempt at assassinating Crota this card in particular calls out some self-doubt. And there are some mentions of like how Tanix worked within the D1 storyline, but it's I'm focusing more on how Eris is relating herself to T- Tanix in this particular card. In the Skolas card, it's also a letter to the Queen. She compares herself to the fallen in general, saying, we too shall adapt and become ruthless in hope of starve- staving off the darkness. And just kind of calling out how the fallen have become just these completely ad- adaptations of what they formerly were. They completely try to fight off what's coming based off of assimilating things that they find. They are these tinkerers. They are the great tinkerers. Uh, when it comes to Gaul, Another character that Ares may not have ever had direct contact with, nor I don't, I don't remember if she had any con- contact with Tanix or Skolos either. She would have had really. well contact, probably not, but she would have heard of them, especially mm-hmm. Tanix. Tanix was and, and Skolos, yeah. And, mm-hmm. I mean, Skolos right. she knows because back like, in D one, I mean, yeah. She because she mentions that she has knowledge of all of these all of these figures. Um, because she mentions in the Gaul card how she felt when the Guardian put Gaul down, basically, because of his, mm-hmm. I think, what was it, his hubris, um, and his, like, his pride in thinking that he would be chosen by the like, but then she, I love how she turns that into, but are we any different type thing? Right. Like, oh my right. gosh, I loved it. Self-reflection. Mm-hmm. Uh, the regarding Gaul Entry is another letter to the queen. She often wonders whether I was chosen or whether I made a choice in my journey throughout this life. Did fate make me or did I make my own fate? Just kind of calling out the idea of, am I destined for this? Is this something I'm just completely 
stuck doing or is there any choice in what I've got going on? So this is kind of another, what I would call another cry out to figuring out what's going, like, why is she the one here? She's dealing with all these nightmares at this point. Uh, regarding Zydron, Gate Lord, it's another letter to the Queen. Eris empathizes with the Gate Lords. It's what drives me in our crusade against the darkness and allows me to persevere even when I feel pushed past my limits, much as I do now. I will not lie to you, my queen. The very fabric of my mind feels twisted and frayed, which I found really interesting as far as the comparison between the Gate Lord and her, in so much that she feels like the Gate Lords may experience something similar, even though the Gate Lords are part of the hive mind aspect of things within the Vex. I don't know. Yeah, but that's that's human to per, to put to project personification. Emotions. And, you know, I think the the point that I took away from that was, you know, in in so far as you can understand and sympathize with the Gate Lords, the way I read it was regardless of what the Gate Lord wants, the Gate Lord has to do this function. Now, mm-hmm. flip it and it's like, well, the Gate Lord, if if our understanding of the Vex is is correct, the Gate Lord wants what it's doing. Like, it, it, you know, that's that's the weird thing of a hive mind is like humans can't fathom really what that means it's mm-hmm. like but we try and you know and i, I love how i how uh eris is presenting like this like well what if it's not really what it wants it's like well you're anthropomorphizing a little bit there like but right. I, I, I see where you're going i do find that these last three cards are probably my favorite of this book because these last three cards are where we really i think get a little bit more insight as to the disturbance of what's going on First of the three is regarding the fanatic. It's a letter to the queen. And Eris, at this point, she hasn't really mentioned this, but this question that she brings up in this book or in this card in particular really kind of shines a light on her on her feelings for the whole thing. What is the pyramid implying? Is this to be my legacy too? Am I fated to fail upon to the whims of the darkness? If that is what the nightmares of Fick will represent... What choice am I left with? I am I have already been stripped of my light. It would be easy for the darkness to take me if I let it. Do I dare? So this card, in my mind, kicks off these last two in so much as she feels like each of these entries or each of these nightmares are a message in particular from the darkness or from the pyramid to her or to whoever is listening at this point. And it's getting in her head. You really see it start to get to her a little bit. Regarding Crota, one of the most feared aspects in her own history, second to last card. It's a letter to the queen. The darkness will win. I can sense it already. I swore I would go on. I can no longer swear this. Always failing. Relieve me. That card in particular is the last card that actually makes it to the queen well- in this book. No, that, the no. regarding the pyramid has one that makes it. Yeah, it has a portion of it, but not the first part. Right, the first she, part doesn't actually a, is undelivered. Correct. She she basically started a note and then delete, 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 and rewrote it and then sent mm-hmm. that. But 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 she did send something to Mara. She sent something to Mara and Ikora in the last one. Right, and she's the opening of that one in regarding the pyramid. It's, I think, more revealing than the second half, Mm -hmm. or the second two-thirds, I should say. The undelivered aspect says, I am at a loss. Never before have I felt so hopeless, so adrift, so tempted. Forgive me for my words, but I understood the allure of the darkness. It is quite powerful sensation to feel so free of care. My fractured mind thrills at the prospect of recklessly abandoning hope. I cannot say I didn't want it to take me. I was weak. I see this now. And later in the card, she has the explanation to Mara about how we've been manipulated, where we've been where the darkness wants it. It's orchestrated its plan magnificently. And then the letter to Ikora is a little less clear, I think, in some respects. Um, She does give Ikora a little bit of, I would say, props, I guess, in so much as you have remained steadfast and supportive of me where others lacked faith. 
which is kind of a nice little tidbit, even though Eris also doesn't feel as caring for Ikoro pretty obviously throughout this entire book as she does for Mara. But she has a more, I think, hopeful letter to Ikora than she does to Mara at the end of this. Mm-hmm. What do you guys think? Neo, do you want to jump in? I don't I I read it in that in the way that um Eris doesn't want Ikora to know how she's feeling. Oh yeah, absolutely. She just wants she's like, thank you for the support. It means a lot. But it's it's a hollow saying. It's mm-hmm. it's like saying I'm fine. Oh yeah, it absolutely is. But there's she does also say that in that respect, this is how we will win. Despair not. Our purpose is good and true. I will not be weighted down by the dark, uh, by, in the dark by my past, my mistakes, or my trauma. Instead, I will use them and they will lift me onto the light. Even though in her mention to Mara, she obviously feels like there is less hopefulness there. She knows that it is very easily trip, to trip up and follow the dark but i don't know what do you guys think there are some interesting aspects throughout this book that are mostly just kind of like not necessarily tidbits but insights into eris's psyche for the time blue i think um the ending with icor there was another another writer and i'll try to i'll try to find this guy because he did a really good job of talking about this kind of this aspect between her and Ikora in so far as if you if you look at the relationship between Ikora and Eris um, you really see that Ikora is uh, really kind of like a, a surface acquaintance friend to Eris and she really is kind of the only one that Eris has within the Vanguard um, or oh, within absolutely. Guardian rank especially um, but Ikora is is like that uh Ikora is like that stereotypical person who is dealing with someone who is grieving or is who is in a, at the middle of a depression or a depressed state um who who is out of their depth they don't have any idea how to deal with it and so Ikora no 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 Ikora is the friend who is dealing with Eris who is in grief and Ikora's response to like, and, and this guy, this guy does a really good job of kind of presenting this the whole thing from Ikora's perspective. But like, what uh, what Ikora does when Eris is going through all this is she basically is like, she, I, I, Eris does the very stereotypical "leave me alone," like just leave me alone. And Ikora, right. you know, f- for those who have experienced a either a depressed state or a state of grief, um, that's a very natural. Uh, thing to do when you're in that state you push people away um most people and that's kind of you know neo i like what you said there is like he she doesn't want ikora to know how she's actually feeling she's just saying yeah i'm fine i'm fine and ikora is one of those characters who's like she you can tell like especially within the cutscenes that like she knows she's not fine but she doesn't know what to do and it was interesting to me because this guy pointed out a really, really interesting thing that I actually missed was when Eris and Ikora first have this conversation before the ghosts start haunting her. It was, I think, it were only Sai and maybe Vel was with her that was just hanging mm-hmm. around. Um, Ikora kind of is like, are you okay? And Eris is like, yeah, we have work to do. And she's talking to our guardian. Yeah. And Ikora's response is basically to send frames to guard an area that Eris has already secured. So she's basically putting robots with guns in it to protect air quote, protect Eris. But the guy, the guy that wrote this and gosh, I'm, I, I feel so bad. I need to find this article, but the guy who wrote it basically was pointing out. So Ikora sent guns to deal with psychological and actual supernatural hauntings. Like what's a gun going to do to a ghost? Like it's not. And, and it was just, right, it was this. Does- it was this way of kind of portraying Ikora as that as a character or that person, a friend who who does care but just has no idea how to connect with oh, them. Oh yeah, but and, I think that's accurate for any of the Vanguard in general. I don't think any of the Vanguard know how to deal with anything psychological at this point. I think they're still reeling from the loss of Cade. Yes, I would agree. But I mean I mean within regards to Eris's grieving and Ikora, I think that is the that's the projection or the the per, 
presentation, I guess, that I really actually, as soon as I read that, I was like, you know what, like all these little pieces that have kind of been floating there seem to kind of connect finally. And that was, that made a lot of sense to me because I was like, yeah, that's exactly what, what I kind of feel. And I couldn't put into words, um, was that Ikora wants to help, but she just has no clue how to, how to. And so she's right. like, okay, um, here's some backup. And it, and Eris is, you know, Eris is basically being polite and being like, okay, whatever. Yeah. You know, thank you. But she doesn't need the frames. Like the things that are hunting Eris and haunting Eris are not physical. They're, they're psychological. They are, they are haunting, literally haunting her. Um, well, in that no, same cut scene, in that same cut scene you were talking about, doesn't also like when after Eris is like, "Come on, we have work to do to our guardian," and then I, I Cord turns to us. Yeah, and she and tasks. Just, like, yeah, she. Her. Yeah, like, she tasks us her. with uh, with helping her. Right. Yeah. It. It. To me, it was like I was reading that and i was like you know that is a really and in and, and the guy's ultimate the the ultimate point of the article was like you know for a first person shooter this is kind of an interesting twist because you don't normally see something like this in a in a you know run and gun game um, right where things are like you fix it by shooting it like with i with eris you fix it by actually purifying these various essences and you 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 know, we kind of were talking about the memory quest at the beginning of the episode where you kind of bring, um, like, I think, what is it with, uh, with Sai, you bring her the necklace, uh, mm-hmm. with Vel, Vel, you bring her the, it's the mark. It's the mark. It's the mark. Um, I'm not sure what you bring on the other, but I mean, like you bring her items that it's are based. Poland's oh, okay. Okay, cool. Poland. And we don't read it. Of course, Poland. that would be really upsetting. Um, Ghost read it. oh gosh, I'm so, I'm so upset now. Um, <laughs> but, but they're touch points. They're, they're touch points of like the highlights of a person's life, which is, which is how you deal, how you process grief is you, you, you don't necessarily forget it, which is what Eris has been trying to do when she talks about the book, the box that she, you know, she buried, you know, it, she, what was it? Lope, reopened a box in my mind, long thought locked, you know, it's contents frightening and heartbreaking. A lot of people compartmentalize and they try to they try to bury the pain and anxiety and stress that grief causes. And really, that's not the way you you address it. You have to face it, you know, and you have to come to terms with the fact that whoever it is or whatever it is, is gone, you know, and and that's just, you know, that's part of existence is things, things move on, things change, things, things fade, what, however you want to say that. Um, and so that's what, that's really kind of where I find personally, I find a lot of enjoyment in talking about like the shadow keep campaign is because it's so much, fo- I mean, one of the most beautiful entries is Eris. Oh God, it's the, it's the jump ship from Eris where she's talking about grief and she's talking about like, you know, it's, it's hell, but we have to keep going. It's just, I don't know. I really, I really appreciate the lore entries and the lore items that were released within the shadow keep because, because of the psychological points to it, you know, the entire thing with the nightmares, um, can also be viewed as, as a dream analysis, you know, like the whole thing with, uh, the entire armor set that gives us bonus damage and bonus protection against nightmares is called the dream bane armor like i mean i don't know how much more on the nose you can get with that uh because the more items from the dream bane armor set that you wear the more protection you have against nightmares you know it's 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 just right it's a dream catcher in some ways right right and then like you know the various aspects of the weapons are actually taken from components that we take from those dreams and purify and and you know if you start looking at like all the essences that you have i think there's like 14 essences um you know the 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 essences that are and we'll get into this definitely uh with the advanced episode but um the essences that we have for the hunts you know are are very big like very big negative emotions like rage fear what is it rage fear isolation pride servitude insanity anguish and despair but then also we have obscurity, envy, brutality, failure, tranquility, and jealousy. And all of tranquility these Tranquility is always the weird one to me. Right. And, and I do have I do kind of have a thought on that one because if you're because if you take it to an extreme, 
right? If you take pride, pride. Sloth. Well, it's not even that. Like tranquility. So the 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 opposite of tranquility is like concern or anxiety, right? Mm-hmm. It's two. It's two extremes. You don't want to be complacent, but you don't want to be like you know panic attacks. Um, if you're if you're extremely tranquil, you're doing nothing. So yes, in a way, it would be sloth like. Um, it'd be, I wouldn't say it's laziness. I, I, sloth would be, you know, the, the thing, um, you're, you're detached. You, you, you don't have a care because you're just, you know, it's just whatever. Whereas if you're not tranquil, if you have concern, that's kind of where I kind of was taking that particular one. I, I will admit that tranquility is the one that it kind of throws a wrench in all of it. Cause I'm like, really, that's the, that's the word choice we're going to go with on, on negative essences. Um, everything else is pretty obvious, right? You know, like pride is hubris, but you, and when you purify it, you know, when you take that essence and you take it through purification, you know, the opposite of pride is, uh, humility or modesty. Um, and it's through the projection or the, through the purification or the healing of these essences that we get more powerful gear. We get the, the additional, armor and weapons that then go on to allow us to confront the next nightmare. And it, it's just like this huge kind of, again, it's just, to me, it's so much on the nose of a dream analysis and of a healing of these, these negative fears and emotions within Eris. And that's why I kind of asked the question, you know, whose, whose nightmares are we actually dealing with here? Um, you know, sure, they take on personifications of things that we recognize, and and I'm I'm not arguing that, like with Fogoth and with um, uh, Gaul and Zydron, definitely fanatic or right, right. But I mean, when you when you read the entries, and I really encourage people if you haven't already read them, go back and read them because in every single one that mentions us, but actually in every single one, Eris calls out her empathizing with that particular emotion. Um, you know, with Tanix, she talks about isolation. With Gaul, she talks about wrath and rage and pride. Um, Skolas, she talks about the pride and the hubris. And, you know, and every time she brings it back into that, what you kind of were mentioning, Green, that self-analysis, but not just self-analysis, she's actually talking about guardians in general, too. Mm-hmm. And it's it's a really cool dive into what I what I really like about this whole story is like, what happens? What happens if we take it too far? Will we become the fallen? Is that our future? You know, what happens if, you know, what, who, who chose us to come back? Was it us or was it destined? You know, these, these questions that are very Osirian, if you will. Um, <laughs> these questions that are very much uh, the exact uh, same quite, questions yeah, I put at the freaking panel at Guardian Con last year. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. A dive into our own nightmares. Right. Right. Well, and I mean, it's, it's, I would say it's, it's a existential crisis on a general level Mm -hmm. and, you know, and kind of like I got, I got looking at the nightmare hunts, you know, and the, the major nightmare hunts, especially, um, it's like a, it's like a, it, there's eight of them and it's kind of, it made me think of like the Buddhist, the eight step or the eight, what is it? The, the path, Eightfold path, eightfold path, right. Uh, it's not a it's not a one to one connection because the eightfold path is much more about the separation of self from your awareness and all that. But it's also you know it's about this this form of transcendence and it's a form of purification of these negative thoughts really because you're going through and as you're you're going through each of these things you're combating and recovering the essences of these negative thoughts to take back to the lectern of enchantment to purify. And that's where you get really kind of this kind of really cool looking, um, I don't want to say it's an analogy, but like this really cool, like psychological model of taking these negative emotions, overcoming the challenge, you know, the, the hunt, hunting down these essences, finding the, the heart of them and bringing them back and then purifying them. And and from that process, you come you become stronger. I thought mm-hmm. that was really a cool thing. But I will completely keep talking about this, so I'm going to just stop talking at this point. Well, I think I mean, as far as like an introduction of this book, there's not a ton of major major details. It's a lot more analysis than there are details in some respects of 
analysis of the psych- psychological aspects like you're talking about, which I would rather, if we could, push that into the advanced episode oh, yeah, definitely. and let you and Neo take that one, because it looks like you both have some really good, interesting aspects to tie into each of these cards in there in particular. And so I would be perfectly happy with us wrapping up the intro session for now and moving into the advanced session and letting you guys go to town on that. I'm game with that. What about uh, you, Neo? You good with that, Neo? All right. Yeah, I just got comfy. Cool. All right, perfect. Uh, do you have any shout-outs for the intro session for us this week, Neo? Uh, I want to shout-out to you guys for having me on. Yeah. Definitely. We are going to hear so much more from you in this next episode. I see your notes and I am excited. And I pull up my chair, my green chair, to the lectern of Neo Mad Dog and mm-hmm. see what you have to say for the next episode. So shout out you to you for not only joining us in this episode, but also being game to do this topic because I know it's not the easiest topic to dive into. Yeah, I, I spent last Friday. Um, basically just reading the entire book and then like researching like I've okay who are these people how does this relate to everything and just going on and on like, yeah I appreciate that like when I pitched it to you you were a little leery and I I I knew that going in but I'm glad that you stepped up for it because it's not it's not an easy book to dive into because there's it's not a clear-cut book so no. good on you for that blue any shout outs for you uh, no, I, I kind of, you know, just to echo what we kind of talked about at the beginning of the episode, um, we really just want to offer you guys who are listening, who have stuck with it this far, uh, a, a place to feel, you know, safe, whether that is coming into the discord to chat about the current events, coming into the discord to chat about games to avoid the current events. You know, I can uh, completely understand both sides of those approaches, um, you know, given everything that's going on out out in the world, uh, just keep on trucking, guys. Like it's, I know it's hard, and I know it's tedious in some cases, and I know it's scary for really everyone. Um, but we will get through it together. Like that's that's all I can. That's that's what I yeah. I have to believe in. So cool. All right. Thank you for your time, and until next time, remember, with wisdom we conquer. Stand strong, stand tall, and keep exploring. With that, we'll begin to wrap the chat up. Thank you again to those over on Twitch for coming to spend your evening with us. If you'd like to join us for the live streaming of the episodes, please be sure to give us a follow over on twitch.tv slash focusedfirechat. Links to all our episode archives can be found at www.thelorenetwork.com. Please be sure to email us at focusfirechat at gmail.com with any comments and or questions for the team concerning the podcast, and let us know how we're doing by giving us some feedback and a rating over on iTunes as well. So until next time, focus your fire and may your light shine bright.